Well, welcome back to the My First Rodeo podcast, the show that asks really cool, interesting, and famous people about the various firsts on their paths to success. Today is no exception. We have a really cool guest today. It's uh, Claude Stewart. You know him from sitcoms. You know him from movies. He is a a touring comedian. I had the privilege of working with him and actually rooming with him because he stayed with me while he was in town. And we recorded a great conversation while he was staying here. First uh, conversation that I used my remote podcast material for did not record in the studio. And uh, it was a lot of fun. Claude is fast paced. He is quick. He is kind of old school comedian in in a really fun way. And uh, I think you're going to enjoy hearing me talk to Claude Stewart in just a little while. But first, I have a special guest here with me. I haven't had a co-host in a little while. Uh, She will not be part of the interview, but uh, I am so proud and pleased and excited to introduce you to my baby, my youngest of five children, Samantha Rose Freed. Say hello, Sammy. Hi. So how you doing? I'm good. We've been talking about having you on the podcast at some point, and today's the day. Are you excited? So excited. That is the reaction of an enthusiastic 15-year-old girl. That's that's the best you get. You get a lot of adjectives. You, you talk in a way, I, I always tell people that you and I kind of have a reality show uh, that nobody watches, just the two of us, a 56-year-old awkward man raising a really cool 15-year-old girl. You feel the same? Do you feel like we have a really weird reality show? I mean, I guess you could put it that way. I think it's fun. I think we laugh a lot and we make fun of each other. And sometimes we act like eighth grade boys and we laugh at the same stupid things. I don't know. What do you attribute that to? I don't know. You're kind of immature, but like in a fun way. And Mm. I feel like that like works for us. It does seem to get us through things. We, uh, we have moments, but uh, I uh, was just telling somebody today, I think it was, that uh, in addition to loving you as I must and as I always will, I like you a lot. I like being with you, and I miss you when you're not here. Thanks. You're welcome. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, what do you want to talk about? Um, tell me about Claude Stewart. Oh, I'm glad you asked. That's a, that is a good segue. Wow. She's made for show business. Isn't she ladies and gentlemen? Claude's cool. You didn't get to meet him while he was here. Cause you were staying at your mom's house that uh, week or those couple days, but uh, he's funny. He's got really spiky hair. Um, he's been on a lot of cool sitcoms like Will and Grace and I believe how I met your mom. And he's done a lot of commercials. He did a lot of uh, Doritos uh, commercials, sort of one of his first big things where he actually got to be mostly nude. Uh, I don't remember the context, but we talk about it a little bit on the show. Great. And, uh, you know, he does everything in comedy and he works really hard. Uh, he does a lot of promotion. He does small venues. He does larger venues. He works with other comedians. He's a regular at the comedy store, which uh, you and I drove past when we were in LA last year. You remember that? Yeah. You saw Mark Marin. I saw Mark, Mark Marin and, uh, Neil Brennan and Eric Griffith, uh, three who I really like. And, uh, he also does cruise ships. He he uh, he performs on cruise ships. You've seen some comedians on cruise ships. That's been a, a mixed bag, wouldn't you say? Yeah, definitely. Some of them are funny, and then some of them are like dirty funny. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's the thing on the cruise ships. Um, they require you to have at least uh, you know several clean shows because there's kids and there's early shows, and then dirty shows. But what I've seen um, a lot of the comedy friends of mine do is uh, particularly ones that are mostly clean is just do a clean show for the dirty show as well. And if it's funny, then the, uh, the drunk audience that came for dirty jokes are okay. I wouldn't know. Yeah. You and I've gone to some of the later shows, haven't we? We've been on cruise ships. Yeah. But I don't really like listening to stuff like that. Mm, Yeah. I don't blame you. Yeah. We, uh, I think I've had you in the back for some of my shows and, uh, it's always interesting for me and, and I get a lot of education through you and through raising you that, I mean, listen, you guys talk about a lot of stuff, probably stuff you don't even let me know you talk about, but you still got a sweet innocence to you. And when you're around particularly adults and they're telling jokes about stuff that maybe even you and your friends might talk about, it's just a little awkward, right? Yes. Like, it's kind of like watching like two old people kiss, like, mm. <laughs> that's that's a good reference. Yeah, I get that. But watching young people kiss is okay. Grey's Anatomy girl. Yes. I was watching a movie. It was like called like 
I think it was like Queen Bees and Wanna Bees. It's mm-hmm. really good. But the there was like two old people kissing, and I was like, I don't know if I should look away. Like, should I give them some privacy? Like, I was very uncomfortable, and they weren't even there. Yeah, but watching other people kiss is always kind of a weird thing. Yeah, but especially old people. Like, I can watch my friends kiss their boyfriends or whatever, and I'm like not that uncomfortable. But like, uh, I mean, I'm a little comfortable because I'm like standing there with the corner. I'm like, oh, okay, this is fun. Like, right. hey, you guys have fun with that. What do I do now? Yeah. <laughs> Little my thumbs. Yeah, like um, should I scroll on TikTok? Like, what do I do? Yeah, life's awkward. And uh, I don't know. Is it? I mean, you're in. You came out of middle school, and that's the worst. Now you're in high school, and I think you navigate it really well. But is the awkwardness of life made easier when you have a father like me that sort of does awkward things in a very big way, and you know, just sort of moves along, or does it make it worse? I don't know. Sometimes. I mean, I used to like doing a lot with you in middle school. I didn't really think other people would see like our TikToks and stuff. But then some of my people I go to school with saw it and like, we remember they like made fun of me kind of. And I don't know, like it affected me. Now that I look back, I don't really care. Like they can say what they want, but I don't know. It's just like, it's just awkward. And middle school was definitely really hard. And high school has its own challenges, but it's like different challenges. Yeah, I could see that. I'm proud of how you're navigating it. But uh, yeah, it just depends on the context of who's looking at things. I mean, I do weird things. And I suppose if one of my lawyer clients that's real serious sees that they look at it differently, then, you know, my friends might look at it. Yeah. And I'm not always good at navigating that. You help me out. Just a few minutes ago, I was ready to put a ladder across a banister of a staircase and you said, not a good idea. In fact, you refused to help me, didn't you? Well, yeah, but then you were like, okay, I'll just do it without you. And that's even stupider. That was stupid. But it got you up out of your half hour nap that turned into three and a half hours. I was tired. I've been working. You have. You're a working girl. Do you want to, uh, uh, before we head out here and, and move to the Claude Stewart interview, do you want to talk about our history of, of ladders and ladder related injuries? <laughs> um, at our old house, it, it went up, like it was pretty tall and he was taking down a wreath and um, he just looked and he was like, oh, the gutters are kind of dirty. Maybe I can just lean over and it'll, um, I, I can clean it real quick. And so that's exactly what he did. And it was about, what, like 30 feet or so? It was over 20 because as it turns out, ladies and gentlemen, if you fall from over 20 feet, uh, they have to do like uh, level one protocol and bring it to some high level hospital to see if you've had a concussion. And so I was outside like doing chalk or something. I don't remember. I was like. Doing chalk. Is that <laughs> that legal in most states? No, like uh, you're not funny. I was doing, I was like drawing with chalk on the sidewalk. I was like 10, but I remember this so clearly. I hear, I didn't hear like a crash or anything. Like I didn't hear anything, but I hear you shout my name. And I was like, oh, he probably like, like I was literally thinking like, oh, he probably wants to show me a ladybug or something. And I don't really want to see. And so I ignored him. She hates ladies about ladybugs. (laughs) And I, so I ignored him. And then, um, you just said my name again. I was like, okay, fine. I'll get up. And so I walked over and I just see this like big ladder on top of you. And uh, like now looking back, it was kind of funny. <laughs> like you were, I just had a big ladder on top of you. I did. But I like screamed. Um, I don't remember if I screamed. I think I screamed for mom. And then I th- ran inside and then the neighbors heard me scream. And so then they came outside and lifted on top of you. And I remember you like, get going away in the ambulance and then mom's friend came over and I like thought you like died uh and lo and behold I did not I uh injured my eye I think I broke or twisted my nose and uh embarrassed myself pretty fully yeah but, it uh, looked like you had gotten I remember seeing you like with the stitches and stuff it looked like you had like gotten beat up I did not look good. I did not look good. But uh, yeah, so uh, I'm not allowed on ladders anymore. So no. the, the long story short, but uh, I uh, just want to let you know, hopefully you'll come back on the show again. I think you're amazing and you are the inspiration for uh, so many things that I do. So thanks for being my girl. Thanks for being my dad. I uh, love you. Ladies and gentlemen, you're going to love Claude Stewart. He's a, he's a lot of fun. And uh, this is me talking to Claude Stewart. Claude Stewart, welcome to the My First Rodeo podcast. Oh my gosh, we already started? We're already in the air? 
we are on the air. Okay. And, uh, yeah, I didn't tell you this before we went on, but you are the first person to ever get interviewed in my dining room. Hey, well, we're here to make history. It's true. I generally do this uh, in a studio. <laughs> but I've had this uh, this little box, whatever it is, sitting around, and I was excited to try it out with you. All right, let's do this. So, uh, man, uh, you are certainly unique amongst the comedians that I've spoken with so far. You are, uh, I don't know, you and I were talking about it a little over dinner. You're, you're, you've got an old schoolness to you in, in some of the ways that you approach things. How, how would you describe your style of comedy? You know, I, I, I like to, uh, to just tell people it's uh, threefold pretty much. Uh, um, I'm, I, I basically, I aim to do three things when I'm on stage. Um, I'm physical and high energy. Uh, I improv with the crowd. Uh, a lot of people who I can see, I get a, yeah, you know, they get a nickname, mm -hmm. right. Uh, and then I, um, have, uh, well, some well-written jokes, you know, mm -hmm. so I tell people I'm, um, a little Jim Carrey, a little Don Rickles, a little Dennis Miller. Mm. Uh, you know, I am not political like Dennis, but like, right. um, a lot of pop culture, a lot of, uh, movie references, you yeah. know, some intellectual, uh, some, uh, certainly some details, some, uh, dates. I know you threw out last yes. night. I like to explain that, uh, the references to the young people and the old people too. Yeah. No, I think that's great. Um, so, um, you mentioned several folks that, that do that or that do one aspect of that. Um, were, were they some of your influences or, or what did influence and sort of educate you in the, the style of comedy that you adopted? Yeah, they all did. You know, it's funny because, um, I mean, Rickles had been doing it forever. I, I didn't really know him as a comedian when I started. I knew him as like a co-host co of some bad show about, oh yeah, America's TV bloopers. It was like him and, and uh, I forget who the other guy was, but, um, but yeah, I just, that was the first time I saw him as a kid, you know, then I got into comedy and I started watching, you know, him doing the roast and, and his old specials. And, you know, he would just walk out and go, God, I've never seen so many people dressed so badly. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm like, I've never seen anybody be that mean to, to the crowd. And then, then the crowd loves it, you know? Sure. Um, but yeah, so I, I think when I started, this is probably, I mean, I'm high energy anyway. But one of the reasons I think I, I probably am so physical and high energy is because when I started comedy, this is in the mid night, mid late nineties, the three biggest things on TV were Kramer from Seinfeld, sure, uh, Jim Carrey and Chris Farley. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, they definitely, you know, influenced me. But I mean, as a kid, I was always into Robin Williams. Uh, I always uh, loved Dennis Miller, um, Eddie Murphy, you know, and of course, Richard Pryor, yeah. George Carlin. Um, and then I got into Bill Hicks, you know, what so are you, what are you about 48, 52. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Too far from me. I'm 56. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we grew up with some of the same influences. That's interesting. So, uh, I know, uh, mom, a teacher, dad, a lawyer. Yeah. Um, so what, uh, what sort of gets you into, to show business? Let's see. Well, I was, uh, I mean, you know, as a, as a skinny kid, I, uh, I developed a, a personality very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, I realized, oh yeah, okay. The football dudes aren't going to try to beat me up if I make them laugh. Um, and then, you know, they liked it. They actually kind of like the John Rickles. They actually liked it when I would playfully roast them, you know? Right. And then I'm like, oh, the hottest chicks, they seem to pay me uh, attention to me when, when I make them laugh too. So it kind of started, you know, that's, that really started my path. And then, um, you know, I, I I'm sorry, it, it was your question. Like what my, first dip in the show business or you mean why I decided to no, no, you're answering it. Oh, okay. Uh, perfect. So that got you into being extroverted and, uh, mm -hmm. to finding that when you were funny or stupid, um, people didn't beat you up and yeah. girls didn't think you were gross. <laughs> exactly. You know, I just, you know, I, I was a prankster. I was always uh, doing uh, ridiculous things. Uh, you know, I remember in high school, I got in trouble because I somehow convinced the teacher, this old lady, to somehow convince her to bend over, pick something up and spell the word run three times. Are you in? Are you in? And then <laughs> once, <laughs> once they <laughs> figured it out, I got in trouble. And yeah, That's uh, elementary school? Or? It's, uh, that was... Uh, middle school. Yeah. yeah. Um, but then, um, but I, I kind of, you know, I, my friends, and I, we like to say we're ahead of our time because, um, this is before jackass this is before any of that stuff. Right. right. We used to call, um, these uh, classroom pranks, we called them class crashes. And here's the deal. We would go in and interrupt a class. Yeah. But the key is this, you have to do it right when the class starts yeah. that that way you can argue it's technically not an interruption, you know? Fair. So I think the first time I did my buddy, he just bet me, he's like, listen, man, I got this really boring class. It's, the guy, we're just talking about equations the entire time. I dare you to come in and do something. I'm like, well, what are you going to get me? He's like, fine, I'll, I'll get you a six pack, whatever you want. Like, sure. Yeah, I'm a broke college kid, right? And so 
I walked in. I was like, all right, hi, I'm looking for the, uh, the Iranian lesbian midget seminar. Is exactly what I said, right? Like, Kevin, this is, this is the nineties, right? So all, all that's acceptable. Sure. And, and the guy was like, uh, sir, no, there's no seminar. I'm like, really? So you don't care about the Iranians. You don't care about the lesbians and you damn sure don't care about the midgets. And he's like, what are you talking? And then I started like uh, imitating. I'm like, you don't know them. They're, they're like this tall. They're like, ah, you know, and it was freaking out. And you know, the class is cracking up. And then I ran out. I, I think I like kicked a, a kicked the garbage can out of uh, fake anger and, and you got, bolted. You got your beer. I, I, I got my beer and then he had to top me. So then, you know, he runs in and uh, what, he, he did something like, oh yeah, I gave him a 12 pack because he was trying to top me. So he walks in while the, the professor's giving a speech and he goes, damn those taxi cabs. Thank you, Donald. I'll take it from here. And he just grabs the teacher's book and say, like, all right, open your, uh, everybody open up page 74. We're discussing the anatomy. And they're like, that, that, uh, who are you? I was like, well, isn't this biology? We're, we're, we're doing the scrotum today. Nothing, you know, damn it. And then he runs. <laughs> Wow. What, so what, what happened kinda, to that guy? Well, there were three of us that used to do it yeah. and um, it, it caught on. And finally, you know, somebody, they would promise us kegs and mm -hmm. keg parties. And then eventually we got, we got busted and uh, we had to do community service. But um, mm -hmm. the person who assigned it to us, we, we told her the stories and she, she thought that we were funny. So she just cut our hours in half and said, get the hell out of here. So, so she's probably afraid of you. <laughs> probably. I was like, I know what you drive lady. Yeah. And, and that's, uh, that's SMU in, in, in uh, Texas, right? SMU, which technically stands for Southern Methodist University. Right. To be honest with you, I think it should be uh, sex, money, and underwear. Yeah. That's pretty much that there. <laughs> There's a lot of that. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's good. At least they wear underwear. <laughs> right? I yeah. mean, if you're going to do it. You know. That's important. That's important. Make it rain. So uh, at that point, you're, uh, you're doing goof, goofy pranks. Um, you're certainly finding yourself. Uh, at what point does it turn into comedy? Here's what's interesting. So, I mean, I was always doing uh, that, that stuff. Uh, my major was uh, uh, radio TV mm -hmm. communications, but I was specifically radio TV. And I started on the radio. Um, I was uh, an intern at this hard rock radio station. It was Z rock, Z rock, crank it up. You know, like yeah, one of those, that's right? That's the campus station. But, but no, 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 this, this was a, looks like a big station. It was, okay. a, it was a legit station in Dallas broadcast out of Dallas, but it was a kind of national cause it was into 35 affiliates across the country, Yeah, you know? So, um, that's I, surreal. it was pretty, Pretty cool, you know, and the guy, the DJ I worked for, his name was Shark Man, and a real funny guy. We, of course, we, it was uh, right as you do, right? right. Um, and we, we still keep in touch on uh, social media. He's uh, still Shark Man, is that his name? Uh, no, he... no, he was Shark Man forever, and then yeah. now, now he's a photography guy. He's got his own photography studio. You I know, see. It, he's really good. Uh, Shark Man photography. Uh, yeah, well, no, now he's Matt. Matt Hobley is his uh, name. Huh. Shout out to you, Matt. Wow. Get some get some clients here. Yeah, uh, right. But I, okay, so I was an uh, an unpaid intern, so I wasn't technically supposed to be, be on the air, right? Yeah. But Shark Man, you know, he thought I was funny, and he's like, here's the deal, kid. Look, uh, just run across the hall, call me on the back line, just call in as some weirdo and the boss is never going to know it's you, yeah. you know? So I did, I would call in as like a redneck or a British guy. You know, I used to do impressions. Yeah. This is back when, you know, Clinton mm. and Perot were like, you know, relevant. And so I was, I, I would call in do all these characters. I'd write his script. I'd have my script, you know, and it was great. We had a lot of fun. People, you know, the audience really dug it. They'd call in and request. And then the boss found out it was me and he called me and I was like, Oh God, I'm going to, lose my hours and all this. I want to get, and, and, and he goes, look, I know it's you. All right. So you know what happens now? I go, no. And he's like, well, now I got to hire you to co-write and uh, wow. co-host the morning show. I was like, yes. So here I am as a college kid, you know, and I was co-hosting. It was a uh, shark man and the dirt clod in the morning. Were you dirt clod? Uh, of course I was dirt clod. I had no uh, control over my nickname. That's yeah, just what I, you don't argue about that. It no, gets worse. just take it, take your licks. Yeah. yeah. But it was cool. And, and I did it, let's see a couple years. And then shark man was a, uh, a shock jock and you're in college um, this whole time yeah i'm in college this right. is a uh, 6 to 10 a.m it was really early in the morning um yeah it was crazy that's why my weekends were always you know party uh but uh but basically we did that it was it was going great and then he's a shock jock so he got in trouble for going too far yeah. he made fun of the boss and all that he gets fired relocates to austin I finish out my hours. They gave me all my credit. Right. And then I just started calling into his Austin morning show, you know, and uh, as dirt clod, yeah, as the dirt clod. And then I was like, well, what? I mean, I, this wasn't every day. I was just do it like every week. But, sure. but then I was like, man, I, you know, I want to do this. How am I going to do stand up? So I just took the bits I wrote for him and right. then did them on the, on stage. Okay. You know? so, so that's how I started. Tell us. Uh, so first uh, stage opportunity is in Texas. 
It's in Texas, my friend. Yeah, I did. Uh, let's see. Uh, there was a talent show and I did five minutes and I, <laughs> you know, you, you've seen how physical I am. I sure, end, indeed. <laughs> ended with some ridiculous thing where I was teaching people how to disco dance and it somehow evolved into break dancing. And that was my big closer. Yeah. Um, but oh my God. Yeah, it was that that went well. And then the th- uh, the second time I was on stage, it was, oh, it was the funniest person at SMU. And that's what it was. My senior year, they did the funniest person at SMU. They'd never done it. It sounds more grandiose than it was. I mean, there's only seven. I was one of seven people. and uh, six, not, a lot, not a lot of funny people. It's other best. Well, no, universe. funny. They're just they're, they're not stand-ups, you know? Yeah, and, right. and then, you know, right before the contest, the other six had mysterious accidents. Oh, well, that helps. So, uh, yeah, I was a shoo-in. Uh, but, no, I mean, I was literally, I'm probably the only one who, like, really wanted to be a comedian, you know? Yeah. The other ones, they tried really hard, but they weren't, you know, like, comedians. Anyway, Mark Britton was his name. He used to call himself the China Man. He, mm-hmm. he was a Chinese-American guy guy really funny he he was the uh, uh basically the judge because he was also performing for our college and then uh he you know he voted me to, to be the winner and then he, he kind of you know gave me some tips and said hey here's some spots you should get up i know this town pretty well and and yeah so i my my comedy uh career was born i guess so there. you started uh, right out of college then mm-hmm. and been doing it ever mm-hmm. since yes sir yeah i started in college yeah that's uh, that's amazing. Uh, and w- what does one do at that point? Uh, you, you just graduated from college. Maybe you have some student loans. Um, what's your next step? Uh, so I was fortunate enough to have uh, parents who lived in Houston. That's about a four hour drive. Right. Um, and I, and I had friends in Dallas. So I, I, I really started in Houston. I mean, I did both cities the, mm-hmm. at the time there were four clubs in both and there's not even that now, which is crazy to me. Um, but there was plenty of uh, spots to get up, you know, and I really made sure to also target. I met some friends of mine, um, uh, uh, you know, or sorry, I met young comics who ended up being buddies of mine, but we would target some open mic places that were re- primarily for musicians, mm-hmm. but we slid in as comedians. And that was great because you had a captive audience and they weren't jaded comics, you know, planning their set list. To, you know, they, they were like, you know, mm-hmm. it's a crowd. They, they, they were glad you were there, you know? And, um, so that's kind of how I started. And there was the, what were the big clubs there? Um, well now it's an improv, but there used to be a, a place called Spellbinder. There was the laugh stop and the laugh spot and comedy showcase and it, and they all were very different gra- graphics because demographics because people forget man Houston is the fourth biggest city in the states sure. you know it's just behind Chicago uh, so there's it's very spread out and uh, every <laughs> every place was different you know one was more rednecky one w- was more uppity yuppie um, one was younger college and then mm-hmm. one was like more military so you kind of had to to adjust your act you know to different one and then I used to do I used to do a black room too. You know, so, so it was, I always challenged myself, all right, I'm going to do the redneck room Tuesday. I'm doing the black room Wednesday. I mean, you know, let, let's do yuppies mm-hmm. you know, this night. And I mean, I, I think that that helped me a lot. Also getting heckled by rednecks uh, really helped me because I, I would do rowdy bars and stuff. And yeah. th- that just kind of helped me like go back at them and have, you know, I always had five like heckler comebacks uh, in my back pocket. Yeah. There, you know, <laughs> I could see all that though. And knowing that you came out of radio, even if it was, uh, you know, in college, but you were doing it at a high level uh, for, for a couple of years and uh, seeing you and then being familiar with your work, um, yeah, I mean, that, that makes sense. It has a morning drive sort of feel to it, doesn't it? Yeah. It, it, and, and that's a big thing they teach you, you know, uh, Mike, when, when, the, when you first start doing the radio, the big thing is no dead air, you know, right. just keep, keep it moving, keep the conversation. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that's, that's probably why I'm so fast paced, you know? Yeah. Does that mean, and obviously that is your style. I, I, I can't imagine you doing anything different, but do you ever, uh, have you experimented with long form stories or, or, or trying to, you know, do something a little different than your nature. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I do, you know, my thing is just, I, I have stories that, that I really enjoy telling uh, my, my rule. This is just me. Look, I don't judge anybody else what they do, you know, but I, I just like to have a lot of little laughs or little jokes within right. the story. Sure. You know, you know, the rule, man, the yeah. longer you go without a laugh, it better yeah. be a great payoff. You know. Yeah. I mean, I've so. heard the rule is every 30 seconds and I think you and I probably go with 15 seconds <laughs> uh, doesn't mean at least in my case that you always get one, but you're at least right, looking right. for a bunch line there or something humorous. No, you're striving for one. You know, yeah. there's, I mean, there's a, there's a story. I just, uh, off the top of my head, there's uh, um, a story I tell. It's a true story too, about oh, when I used to work at Blockbuster Video. This is mm-hmm. when I lived in LA. I had four part-time jobs. I never had a day off. Blockbuster Video, I would work there in the morning and then across the street, I worked at a restaurant at night. And sometimes people would see me at the restaurant 
And they also had seen me at Blockbuster. They go, wait, aren't you the guy from across the street? I go, yes. Do you need a pool boy or a babysitter? Because <laughs> I am starving. So yeah. uh, that happened a lot. But honestly, man, one of the, uh, and this is a, a true story. I can tell it to you if you want. Sure. But um, my third day on the job, uh, O.J. Simpson came in. This is Blockbuster? This is Blockbuster. What does O.J. Simpson rent out in uh, circa, what, 1995? Uh, this is 97. This is 97, probably. Right. And I kid you not, I am not making this up he owed a late fee remember blockbuster late fees yeah, yeah, right we- i will never forget this he owed 153 dollars and 10 cents on a movie what the, was it the name of the movie i kid you not murder at 1600 oh, come on. You i have been swear a to god it was murder at 1600 wow, he it was, was studying wasn't he, he was, that's exactly what he was doing wow but you remember the plot <laughs> is it any similarities it's a, uh no no it's a little more conspiracy government it's, it's a wesley snipes uh okay. and a, dennis miller's actually in it yeah uh it, it it's pretty, it, it's entertaining, but this is the, the, the bit I basically do. And it's, it's pretty true. And, oh, and by the way, do you remember this? Do you remember when, when uh, OJ wrote that bestseller called If I Did It? Yeah, yeah, it was <laughs> hypothetical. And remember they, that? Basically a long confession. <laughs> right. I didn't kill those people, but if I did it, if this did, is how I would have done it. You know? Exactly. And it yeah. happened to track pretty well. Yes. Oh my God. But, but yeah, he owed $153.10 in the movie. Um, I'm nervous. You know, it's my third day on the job. I'm looking at he's, a convicted. He's not a com- oh, he's a convicted murderer. Well, no, no, he's he's accused at this oh, point. Oh my yeah. gosh, and he's uh, uh, violating yeah. other laws. And yes, so he comes in. I got to tell him the name. I'm, I'm like, uh, uh, I didn't want to tell him the name of the movie. I was like, you owe 153 dollars and ten cents. He goes, Oh yeah, what movie? I'm like, um, it's an action. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to say it, but then Mike, boom, I had a brilliant idea. What if I find a way to delete his charges? You know, yeah, everything's good. That's wise. So, so that that was my plan. Now, here's the, but keep in mind, the only problem is I'm nervous. I'm, right. I'm putting my foot in my mouth and saying the wrong thing. So I'm yeah. like, uh, OJ, I'm gonna try to take care of this at free. All right, let me just delete your charges. Let me just take a quick stab in the dark. <laughs> oh, sorry. Don't mind me. I'm an idiot. Yeah. I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer. Yeah. Oh well. God. Uh, that, yeah, that was me. Guilty. Yeah. I, finally, I, I was like, oh, OJ, I, I did it. I deleted your charges. Check it out, dude. You just got away with murder. Yeah. And then, you know, it's very tense. It's very awkward. And then OJ leaned over the counter and said, look, I didn't rent that movie. Mm. But if I did it, <laughs> this is how it <laughs> so, you know, that, that, that's an example of like a story. You know, that is a good, yeah, and that's a good story. And like you say, it's got uh, it's got uh, a bunch of different punches within the middle of it. Yeah, that, that's like you said, that's what I strive for. You yeah. Know? <laughs> yeah, I like that. That's great. So talk about uh, how things start to take off for you. It, it starts slow or do you get some big breaks pretty early on? Yeah. So, OK, I I, um, I I got lucky my first year in L.A. because I happened to be at a party. I was at, I was taking an improv class and I just happened to be at a party with the girls in my improv class. And she was very good friends with uh, one of the writers for Dennis Miller for his mm-hmm. HBO show. OK. And the only female writer on the show. And uh, she. She, um, Leah Krinsky has her name and she's a uh, super funny and we were talking and, and, uh, I told her, you know, I'm a huge fan of, you know, of Dennis and she was telling me stories and she, apparently he would always give her shit like playfully. He's like, listen, chicks aren't funny, but go ahead. What you got for me? Touch, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, she'd always give him shit back and that's why I liked her anyway. Um, I was like, look, here's my number. If something opens up, I would love to be part of the show. Lo and behold, they, they needed basically a paid intern, um, just the day of the show, just Friday. But you know, they pay me. I mean, at the time I'm like, sure, I'll come in, work a day for a hundred bucks, see the show for free, uh, eat mm-hmm. a couple meals for free and hang out in the writer's room, you know, but which, which show was this now? Dennis Miller live. Okay. Remember he, he had an HBO show. I yeah, want to yeah. say 94 to like 2001. Okay. Right around there. But I was on it for three, three years, you wow, know? Um, great. and it was very cool. Just the day of the show, just Friday. Um, but it was great to watch him work because, uh, man, he didn't write uh, the bulk of the show. The writers would come up at least with a shell of it. Right. And they go, all right, Dennis, here we go. Here's this. And they would pitch jokes and he'd go, he'd either say, keep it or, or he'd say, lose it. Mm-hmm. But my favorite is when he would go, I like it. Here's the deal. You need a new verb or mm-hmm. let's change this word. And he literally would replace one word and improve the joke 10 times. Wow. You know, it, the talent. he's quite a wordsmith, you know? Um, but I tell you the first time I met him, man, I, I freaked him out. I didn't mean to, but, uh, um, apparently he had a couple of stalkers and I didn't know this, you know, all I knew is my boss was like, Hey, here are the jokes. Here's a big box of them. Can you just drop them to the writer's room? Great. I go in there. 
I open the door. I'm quiet. As I open the door, Dennis has his back to me at, at the end of a round table. And he's like, okay, babe, here's the deal. Let's move the rant over here. Let's put the monologue over here. Who's next? Right. And uh, the head writer looks up to me like, yeah, what do you need? And I'm right behind him with, with all the jokes. And I guess I said it kind of loud. I was like, oh, hey, I got, I got these. And he turns around and he goes, Jesus, who the hell's that guy? <laughs> <laughs> he gets up and walks out of the room. And I was like, well, what do I do? They all start laughing. They go, don't worry about it, buddy. He's sensitive here. Just drop the jokes off. Okay. And so as I'm walking out, Dennis is in a little room and he's just kind of walking around with his hands on his temples. And I go, uh, uh, Dennis, sorry, buddy. I didn't mean to, to, you know, to scare you. And he goes, Jesus, I'm wigging over here, babe. I'm wigging. Like, <laughs> but apparently I had a couple of stalkers and, and one of them was the lady that she wasn't like uh, violent. It wasn't like a uh, baby reindeer on, mm. on Netflix or something. Uh, she just was obsessed with him and she had a cane. She moved very slow. So, you know, she's not going to, you know, chase him. So what they did is this, they go, we're going to give you a front row seat. It's in the corner. It's your own special seat. And that's how they dealt with her. You wow. know, that way she wouldn't bug him and she Gave had her own she seat. wanted, you know, absolutely. You know, tell you this though, you'd appreciate this reference. Um, he never called me Claude. Oh, okay. He had two nicknames for me and, uh, I didn't even know if he knew my name, but, um, now keep in mind, I was 20 pounds more muscle. I had a very preppy long blonde kind of, uh, haircut. Yeah. He would call me either Blondie uh -huh. or he would call me Zabka. William Zabka. Uh. Do you remember the blonde preppy dickhead from, uh, um, you know, karate kid, yeah, sure. the villain, all right, all right. right. And, and he'd walk up and go, Hey, Zabka, you kick any macho ass today, babe? And that's for three years. <laughs> three years. Three years you got to do that. <laughs> and what else are you doing during those three years? Because you're only working Friday. Well, yeah. So here's my set schedule when I first moved to LA. Uh, so I, I had the Daily Grill. It was a restaurant at night. Across the street, I had Blockbuster. Um, I had Dennis uh, Miller on Friday. And then on the weekends, during the day, if I wanted, I did market research. So I showed people, this is VHSs. This is how old I am. I would show them a 30-second trailer to a movie and interview them for like five minutes. And see you know, what they liked, what they didn't like. Oh, wow. You're I know. Patient. It was crazy. I know. It was insane. It was, uh, but you know, I mean, this is what mid late nineties, just out of college. I'm like, I'm, yeah, I, I think all I needed to make was sixteen hundred a month. Like, wow. I know that's all I needed to make to, to survive in LA. And you're um, getting some stage time along the way there. Yeah. So okay, uh, I made sure my schedule. I, I I had nights off for sure, and uh, I I try to get up five times a week. I always tell comedians if you can do five, great. But three, you can you will consistently you're able to generate consistent material if you at least get up three times a week you know in mm -hmm. la so, those are short sets too right yeah but i mean the more you hang out the more people you know and you'll end up doing 10 15 okay. 20 then you go on the outskirts of the oc then there's you know headlining gigs and Right, right, you know, right, right. A, lot, a lot more stage time, but, uh, but yeah. And then, Oh, I'll tell you this, uh, a little side note too. Uh, back when I was single working on Dennis Miller, the thing I loved uh, about it too, is that, uh, it was a cheap date night, yeah. you know, cause obviously I wasn't making my m money at the time. And, uh, what I would do is I was like, Oh, I tell you what, I'm working on, working on this TV show. Why don't I get you in for free to the show? Yeah. And then we'll go have a drink, you know? And, nice. and, and so what they well, would come to the show was a drink. Yeah, that's it. And, uh, this, the best margaritas in town, El Coyote is yeah. the name of it. It was right there by the studio and they would they were only open at midnight so by midnight you knew if you're going to close the deal or not you know yeah, yeah, if you didn't get along no problem i bought her some drinks have a nice life you know right but if you did hey it's uh my place is open so that's a good you know. plan it sounds like an la story <laughs> absolutely and uh so when do things start popping from there uh, is the the dennis miller show runs its course after three years well it was still going on but i started doing the road okay. you know and as it, i just kind of had to make a choice you know do i want to do this or you know want to take mm -hmm. the next level and um how I started doing the road, actually, I, I, um, I did get lucky because I got a commercial agent, started booking commercials. And my, my first big one it was for Doritos. Do you remember Allie Landry, the Doritos girl? She was absolutely beautiful. And like late 90s th through the 2000s, probably, she just had a big campaign. She, she was a model turned actress, you know. And but, she liked Doritos. But, uh, like, big fan. <laughs> I understand. But my first one was, was uh, one with her, and it was a campaign all over the UK. And uh, I had to get naked in it, actually. And 
a Doritos commercial? In a, yeah, no, UK, they can show a little bit more. It was just my backside. But still, yeah. it was one of these things where um, she and I are kind of hanging out. And I get, and she goes, do you fancy a dip? And I go, yeah. Uh, you know, because I, I brought her some food and I had like some Doritos. Uh, yeah, but I don't have a costume. That's what they call bathing suits, you know, in yeah. the UK. She goes, well, who needs a costume? I was like, all right. You know, so I think right. she wants to get bit. So she goes and, and makes us like a dip and stuff. And she goes, I'll be right back. Unbeknownst to, to me, I'm like, all right. So oh, I basically no. strip and then she comes back and kind of looks at me. And then the, the last scene you meet is you see is like me covering up and I'm running like by the pool behind uh, her. So you have to have <laughs> one of those socks on your. Uh, I did. did you? Yes. They made me a sock. Um, the only tattoo I have is on my ass. So yeah. it, it, it took them a while to cover it up with makeup. But, uh, you know, it, in, a, in a way, my ass made me money because it, it got me into overtime. Yeah. It took them forever to. Oh, <laughs> so bigger tattoos on your ass is the advice you're giving to the. Uh, the youth. The, the youth aspiring to do Doritos commercials with supermodels. Yes. That's pretty cool. So you're you're, you're doing that. You get some money, a little bit of money. Yeah. So I had I had that. I booked some other ones. I had uh, I remember I had a big one for uh, Jeep Cherokee. Uh, they played it during all the sporting events. I did one for Heineken, the Honda. You know, I did a lot of big ones. Grape nuts. Oh, hilarious. I did a Midol commercial. Yeah. It, yeah. It was uh, four women talking about like, oh my gosh, do you have any? It, she, I don't know. They're all comparing the pills they take and one of them's like, do you have anything for bloating? Yes, try these. Do you have anything for cramps? Yeah, try these. They're at a restaurant and they're all comparing their pills, you know? And then I think I... I and you just happened to be at their table? I was the waiter. Uh, I was their really waiter. freaking annoying waiter. Yeah, 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 and then I think I go... Uh, uh, you have know, anything for a headache? And they all look out like, who the hell is that guy? You know? Yeah. So th that's all I said, but very, it was a, very empathic you know, to women. Is, uh, yeah. For. That's nice. An ally, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so the point is that I had this money coming in then there was a big uh, commercial strike and then I just went on the road, man. You know, mm. I had some dates booked in uh, the Midwest specifically, because there were tons of clubs out there. I would go to the Midwest. Like, let, let's say I had something in Ohio. I had something in Dayton, Ohio, right? Mm. Then I would just book myself doing guest spots in like Cincinnati, Cleveland, mm. Columbus, you know, whatever was around there. And then I'd go over to, I'd go to Michigan. I'd go to Louisville, Kentucky, you know, wherever I, I could drive to and just take advantage of all, all the clubs. And then if they like me, then they would give me dates. And yeah. that's kind of how I started doing the road. That's very cool. So, I mean, a very different time when you say, I mean, you're, um, th there are a lot of clubs. That's sort of the, the renaissance of comedy clubs. There's, uh, there's less comedians. I mean, I'm sure there's still plenty, but it's not. Like I don't now. find there's less. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it just seems like everybody and their brother's a comedian now. That's so. what I'm saying. There's, oh, you're talking about, you're yeah. talking about there's less comedians back when I did. Yeah, yeah I'm saying. Yes, sorry. sorry. I thought you meant now. I'm no, like, no. I'm saying you're at a time where you're good. Um, there's lots of clubs. Yeah. And, uh, and you don't need to necessarily have a following to, to get the gigs, whereas Correct. nowadays, I mean, describe that for our audience, how it's a little different. Yeah. I mean, that, that's what they're looking at They're, You know, uh, I'm not saying, look, you can, you can definitely get started at comedy anytime. You don't have to have a, a ton of followers to, to have a career necessarily, but uh, followers are very important right now. I would say a lot of uh, people who hire comedians, they kind of look at it as digital currency, right. you know? So <laughs> no disrespect to my crypto buddies. Yeah. Of uh, course. But, uh, but yeah, that's, I would, I would think that's it. You have a strong argument. It's easier to barter for uh, a, a comedy date if you have yeah. people following you. Yeah. So. And I don't know. I grew up uh, not as a comedian, but watching a lot of comedians. And I would go to a comedy club just to see funny people, not because I knew who they were, not because they were on SNL, not because yeah. they were on that sitcom, um, not because, you know, they had a special, uh, you know, those things, some of them didn't exist and it just didn't matter to me. And, and the clubs were full. Yeah. Um, and I think yeah. that's probably where you were coming up, where people just wanted to see a funny person. If you were yes. funny, they enjoyed that. I mean, I came, you know, I started, I mean, I said 95 is when I very first started, but, but it was still after the the boom. You know, the boom was in the 80s that went into the early 90s. Right. And then it, it, it just kind of stopped. I mean, I, I remember one time a club owner said, oh, yeah, it, it's cyclical. I mean, every, you know, every 10 years, there's a new big thing. You know, uh, he was telling me in the 70s, it was disco. In the 80s, it was comedy. That's what people did. They went out. It was like a perfect date, you know. Yeah. And then, you know, kind of. 
it, it, it just kind of changed. You know, there, there's always just something new. You know, the kids start to go into raves, uh, you know, mm-hmm. uh, there are people. And then the country line dancing kind of became a thing in some, you know, some bars. It still is, apparently. Still is, you know, hip hop. You know, I mean, there's people started doing other things, you know. Yeah. Um, but I, I will say that um, I, I think there, I've noticed at least, there's definitely since the pan- pandemic faded, uh, there's been a resurgence of comedy. And, and I yeah. think it's great. You know? Yeah. Well, I mean, a lot of people watched a lot of comedy during the pandemic, so they, they yes. like it. And they know. missed seeing it live. I think that's know? right. I hope that's true. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know if you find this, but I find that people come to comedy shows and they still think they're watching Netflix. They forget that there's a real <laughs> human being standing on the yeah, stage. Yeah. Sometimes they treat you like a hologram, you know? Or they just keep having their conversation as if you're not there. Yeah. I, I hate that. You know why? I, I just think it's disrespectful. Like, like I, I would never do that. Before I started comedy, yeah. I would never pay to see a comedian and sit there jabber you right. know? Like, but, what are you doing? Yeah. I think it's just, uh, yeah, human connections uh, are a lot different than they, they were, as you said, before the pandemic. I blame phones. You think it's, phone? you know, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. It's a blessing and a curse. You know, you're a businessman. I mean, the, the reason I say this is because like, it's a blessing because you can literally be on an airplane and, yeah. and, and book a job. I can do the sure. same thing, you know, right. but it's a curse because it's taking us out of like what you and I are doing right now. We're looking at each other in the yeah. eye, we're listening right. and, and we're, t- we're having a conversation. And, right. I, and I think the phone takes the listening out of a lot of it. Yeah. You know? No, it does. I mean, eye contact. I don't know. You, like, <laughs> we're doing it now, but yeah, you, yeah. you don't. Uh, th- there's a lost art of that. You could have a whole conversation sitting across the table from somebody and never make eye contact. Yeah. Nobody thinks that's weird anymore. That's like serial killer stuff. It, it is serial killer stuff. <laughs> and you can't blame it on autism. All right. I know there's a lot of you out there, but come on. Unless I, we all have it. <laughs> I guess. This is a true story, Mike. I was, uh, okay, um, uh, doing a show. This uh, lady in the front row would not get off her phone. Okay. I don't know what was in her phone that made it glow like so bright purple right. maybe an avatar dipped in grape jelly yeah <laughs> but yeah. it was lit like lit up like a, a christmas tree and to the point where people were getting distracted and like you know it, wincing yeah. at her right finally i grab her phone i go tell you what sweetheart you get your toy back when you act like a grown-up okay <laughs> and they're good. they're on my side they're yeah. like ha 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 right this lady stands up and goes yeah. hey buddy i was texting my disabled daughter oh no So I just paused and said, well, ma'am, she's obviously not that disabled because she keeps texting you back. (laughs) Mike, these are long, fast text backs. I mean, how disabled could she possibly be? Clearly, she's got at least one thumb and one eye. Right. Yeah. (laughs) Hard to feel sympathetic. (laughs) <laughs> but those moments are great because they add to your show. You know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And she didn't hit you or anything. She ended up laughing because yeah. it was so absurd. Yeah, you know? that's pretty funny. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so you're on the road. Uh, you're getting some gigs. The clubs like you, and yeah. uh, you know, I know what hap- I know what ultimately happens. Tell me how you get mm-hmm. from there to there. Mm-hmm. Oh, with, with the the next big thing. Yeah, the next mm-hmm. big thing, and opportunity to be on the Tonight Show, and then oh so yeah, forth. yeah. No, that that was very cool. Actually, I did. Uh, I mean, I, I guess it was the first time I did a, like a stand up on TV. It was probably oh probably at Comics Unleashed. Uh, do you remember Byron Allen would have that? Sure. It was you'd know, be on the couches and they have four of us. Uh, that that was fun. I um uh, my buddy Sam Tripoli, super. Fun. I don't know if you know Sam Tripoli. He's a uh, he's got he's got this conspiracy podcast. It was it called oh the Tinfoil Podcast. Okay. Ten, tinfoil Hat Podcast. Sorry. Okay. Uh, I have heard. That, but yeah. he, he's very funny. Uh, but anyway, he was, he did the show. He killed on it. He, he referred me. And, uh, f- fortunately I killed on it. And, uh, yeah, that was the first time it is stand up. But yeah, the tonight show, it was interesting how it happened. It was, it was, it was a different route. I used to do these, uh, casting director workshops, right? Where I don't know, you pay 35 bucks, whatever you get to read in front of a casting director. They've got your headshot. They've got your resume. Then hopefully they call you in to audition, yeah, yeah. right? Not, not for anything specific. It's just, they get to know you. Well, I mean, you know, their biggest credits, you know, right. like I, I did an episode of will of grace sure. because of this you know like i knew it was the cat i was reading for the casting director of will and grace and you know so that's that's just an example but i do i do know that um the person who at least uh cast the sketches on on the tonight show i could read for her you know right. so i did and then they were like hey if anybody has a monologue anybody has stand up go ahead and do it and they gave you a long time because usually you know you do a tonight show it's like five minutes right they let me do up to 10 so i made sure man i did as many jokes as i could as right. possible and i closed on a bit it was a little racy but at the time they were letting comedians go a little racier you know okay. i remember i mean i remember remember ralphie may sure right i i remember oh my god he said something like he had some joke where he goes 
Or, oh, really? You don't believe it? Oh, it's something he was talking about his weight. And he's like, to say I don't like food is, is to like is like saying Jay doesn't like cars and the leader of the band over here has never banged a fat white chick. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> they let him do that. Hey, right? it was hilarious. So, so but anyway, um, the point is this. I, I close with like kind of a long bit. It's like a three minute bit. You were talking about stories where I, I do an analogy of like, you know, it's so hard for men. Like, why, why do men cheat? Like, and it's like it. it it's, it's, it's just like asking, you know, why do, why is it so hard for, for women to not buy shoes? Mm. And I make it an analogy of the women shoe shopping to men cheating right, and this right. whole thing. But anyway, um, the, uh, the point, the reason I'm telling you that is, is she really liked that bit, you know, and, and I didn't hear anything from it for a little while. And then boom, they call me in for a sketch. And, uh, th- at the time he was doing this thing, uh, undercover J. Do you remember that show that CBS did called undercover boss? Yeah, sure. The, right. The CEO would on, go under, I, I think so. Well, he, so he did undercover J where he would, you know, go in and he's like, well, let's see what the writers are up to. And he pretend to have a beard and a hat and he kind of sneak in. And I was just one of the ridiculous writers, okay. you know, and we're, there we are drinking on the job and doing Jay Leno impressions you know <laughs> like, actually pretty good yeah yeah and so he was um uh, and, and he was very nice um but anyway and, and that's kind of how i got it you know first i did that and then uh you know she said something to the two guys at the time uh who they were you know uh casting comedians and she's like hey this guy's funny I actually saw him do stand up he did 10 minutes and I, it was killer great and so then that's fine yeah of the 10 what five are you gonna do and then that's uh-huh. how it happened so yeah that's pretty neat so what it feel like and uh you know, how, how does that whole day go? Well, you do it in the afternoon, you know, so it's a little bit different. Like you and I are used to working at night, right? right. You know, it's eight o'clock and you know, 10 o'clock show. I mean, this is, I mean, but by, I guess by the time you shoot, you know, maybe it's four 30, you know, maybe, maybe five, but still it's just like the whole time, you know, I couldn't eat too much during the day. You know what I mean? It's like right. the, the whole day. Like, All right, here we go. You know, and you're kind of going over your hand, you, you know what you're going to say. And it, I mean, five minutes, it goes by super quick, sure. you know, but, but it's awesome. I mean, they're all, I mean, they're warmed up, you know, the warm up act that, uh, you know, he's, He's funny, but he's not necessarily doing jokes. He's getting them to clap. He's making them dance. You know, there's music. So, th- I mean, th- they're ready to rock. So mm-hmm. you walk out to, yeah, you know, it, yeah. it's like a concert, you know, it's, I, that's why I tell the, the other younger comics, like, if you do a late night spot or if you do a, uh, any spot like that, take the pressure off yourself and just know that literally what you're doing, you're doing a five minute concert. Yeah. You know, with so a really hot audience. They're ready to rock, you know, yeah. and you don't have to do an encore and you don't have to follow some other amazing band. It's it's five minutes in and out. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> you know? that's great. And, and Jay liked you? Yeah. 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 You know, I but I will say, I'll say this, though. And he, and listen, what I love about Jay is he, I mean, he clearly loves stand up because oh, he's yeah. still doing it. I mean, there's a club out there in uh, Burbank. I just did the Burbank Comedy Festival. I made the best of the fest. Thank uh, you very much. Hey, nice but, work. Uh, thank you. No, but he, uh, he's there all the time. You know, and he doesn't have to be. I mean, how many cars does a guy have? Yeah. One for every day of the year, you know? Least, yeah. But I love the fact that he he loves the craft. And and I saw an interview with him. I saw him on a podcast and he goes, I enjoy watching comedians on dry bar because I know it's going to be clean. It's going to be clever. And a, a lot of them I haven't heard of. So I get to to meet new ones, you yeah. know? So it's it's cool that he's doing the research, you know? I do wish, um, at least when I was on there, I, I wish he was putting more comedians on. Yeah. You know, I remember like uh, for a while, Johnny had one on every night. Yeah. He'd at least have one on every Friday. Jay didn't put it, but, but to be honest with you, man, I, I, I think he just let other people make the call. Yeah. I, I think they were kind of like, okay, let's get the biggest celebrities ever. And let's uh, get music. And you know, that's what they've all turned into to some degree. Yes, so, absolutely. So does yeah. that, um, become an immediate benefit? I mean, obviously it's amazing credential. Does it turn into opportunities? Yeah. So, well, I mean, look, I mean, the more TV credits you get, the, the more you can parlay them, you, right. you know, the, the, the more you can, I'm not saying it happens all the time, but the more you can ask for more money, you can get into bigger, better venues. You know, I mean, that that's the goal, but you know what, Mike, it's, it's, it has changed. I mean, it used to be every comedian just wanted to do a late night set or a comedy central set. If, you know, if you can do that, boom, you know, like now it's, it's really more streaming. It's like, if I can right. get a dry bar special, if I can get a special on Tubi or if I can get like a Netflix appearance or you know, anything where people stream, that seems to be, yeah. you know, or Kinda interesting. I mean, cause we're, we're putting free content out there, uh, which automatically puts pressure on you because now you don't necessarily want people to come hear all the same jokes. Right. So you right. got to go start writing more. And that's why you see people like Matt, Matt Reif. And I've seen Dane Cook is doing this to, now, but I see a lot of comedians doing this now where they're, it's just crowd work. They're, they're posting crowd work. They're not posting the new jokes. They don't want to give them away. Yeah. Right. They want to save them to the next special, you know? All right. So I get why they do that. But, it, you know, again, we talk about a blessing and a curse. I mean, you know, the curse is 
now uh, some audience members think, oh, this is what they're going to do. I'll just yell some shit out. They'll react. You know, well, not every comedian wants that. That's it. Yeah. Because I mean, that, that is becoming popular. And there are some folks that are touring with mostly crowd work and, Who's to say it's not good if people like it and they're paying to see it? No, no, absolutely. And listen, I mean, uh, Matt Reif, I mean, he's smart about it because I think he goes up there, he goes, hey, guys, I'm going to do my show and then we'll do some Q&A and we'll have some fun after. Yeah. You know, so he does his show, he's working on his new act and then, you know, everything he posts is just the Q&A because he doesn't want to give away that hour when it's not ready yet, you know? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, and I guess he has one of each out now, right? Yeah. I think he has a crowd work hour and then a... Uh, a stand-up hour, which is supposed to prove that he doesn't just do crowd work. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's funny uh, because you know, I'm a screenwriter as well. Uh, One of my writing partners and I, we just got a, um, we got our, uh, uh, the screenplay to Matt um, because uh, yeah, a producer we're working with, she pitched it to his manager and he's like, Oh, that's funny. I'll I'll get that to Matt. You know, so we're, that's kind of neat. We're waiting to see what happens, you know, because I think you would like it. It was, um, we were talking about this. We're like, you know, there's not that many R rated Christmas comedies, Uh, you know, I mean, bad Santa, that's the Holy Grail with it. Sure. But there's like six, like as far as like legitimate, you know, hits. So we came up with this idea, honestly, this is like you and I are doing right now. We drank it, we split a bottle of bourbon. Yeah. Came up with an idea, woke up and said, no, that that actually was pretty good. And uh, so basically very simple, uh, an unemployed divorced dad gets a lucrative gig dressing like Santa Mm -hmm. while working as a male escort. Mm. Okay. So it's, it's basically Deuce Bigelow, you know, American Gigolo, right? Uh, Meets bad Santa. Yeah. With an actual good looking uh, Gigolo. And it's when we first came up with the idea, we kind of thought, well, maybe uh, like uh, Adam Devine, yeah. you know him? Yeah. But yeah, we were thinking like him because he's good looking, but he's like short and quirky, you know? Yeah. But then, um, the, uh, you know, the producer goes, hey, can I get it to Matt Rife? I'm like, yeah, hell yeah. I mean, he's he's younger than what we imagine, but yeah. we can we can change the numbers on, a little bit. I can know? see that working. I could see that working. I hope that yeah. turns out for you. Thank you, brother. I, uh, you know, we have a tattoo. It is uh, Craig Robinson. Yeah. He, he's attached to it. Yeah. Okay. He's great, man. He's super approachable. Very cool guy. That's you know? pretty neat. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, before we go, talk about uh, the screenwriting and talk about the the movies. Oh, yes, yes. Okay, so um, I, I just uh, wrapped a movie with uh, John Cleese and Sean Astin. Uh, I, I did not write it. My my uh, One of my producing partners, Ian Harris, brilliant guy, uh, we're in a production company. It's called uh, Three Degrees Entertainment. Mm-hmm. There's four of us, my friends Lauren and Zay and uh, me and, and Ian. But Ian had this idea, and it was it basically, uh, it's called Standby. And it's about a 50-year-old man. Uh, he's never been off his farm in Nebraska. Okay, he was raised there. His parents pass away. They leave him the farm. He's always had this dream of, of getting on a plane and flying to New York. But he has an extreme fear and anxiety of flying. He just has not been able to get over it, right? Mm-hmm. So the entire time he's in an airport and he's just trying to overcome his fear, just get on standby and do it, you know? Um, it's I tell you what it's like a lot. It's a lot like, did you ever see Peter Sellers' final movie being there? I did. I don't think I have. Dude, there's your assignment. As a comedian, right. Go see it. to another comedian, see that. It's it's brilliant. It's right. uh, um, But the reason I'm bringing this up is um, he kind of encounters the five stages of life mm-hmm. when, when he's on uh, in the airport. Um, he helps a woman give birth. He's very comfortable because he, you know, he's with the cows all day, you know, sure. right? Uh, he saves a choking child. Yeah. Um, he talks to it like this teen angst, uh, you know, girl and convinces her to like, no, no, have a conversation with your parents and kind of fi- yeah. fixes a problem, you know, with her life. Um, he's got a love interest, you know, that's like his age. And then the final, uh, I'm not going to give it away, but he finds there's a death that happens, but yeah. he, but he helps the person who, who ends wow, up. Dying, that's a know? busy airport. It's a- <laughs> I'm usually just looking for chicklets myself. <laughs> <I know. laughs> Dude, I'm lucky if I buy hand sanitizer, yeah, you know, yeah, absolutely. this guy's checking all the boxes, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, so that's, well, we just wrapped that and it, um, it's called standby. Um, there's a movie I wrote. It's in development right now. It's called killer book club. It's basically, um, in an act of desperate self-defense four women in a book club, murder an unhinged man. Right. And then they quickly become responsible for a string of questionable revenge killings. Right. So, <laughs> um, but we got a great cast, man. We have a uh, Vivica A. Fox, wow. um, Monica Potter, she was on Parenthood. Yeah. yeah uh, she's along came a spider patch Adams. Like she's done a lot of big ones. Um, we got uh, Jamie Kennedy, uh, Craig Robinson again, wow. and uh, Jay Moore, you know, it's pretty neat. So it's good, man. We got, uh, you know, we're just, um, 
we're shopping it around and uh, waiting for the person to, to write the check. So how do you find all the time? <laughs> it's hard. Yeah. It is not easy, but I'll tell you this, I mean, I ended up writing a lot during the pandemic. Oh, I um, see. Well, there wasn't, you know, you know how yeah. it was. And here's the deal, dude. I don't know what, who you were, were seeing with, but we, we stayed with my mother-in-law cause she was alone. Yeah. We didn't want her to be alone and she's got some health problems and uh, she has a five bedroom home, which is more room for my little kid to bounce off the walls. Right. right. But dude, I kid you not every meal yeah. I was forced to eat with my alcoholic chain smoking, <laughs> phlegm coughing mother-in-law. Okay. <laughs> with a five bedroom my, house. My, my temperamental kid, my, uh, micromanaging judgmental wife, right? right? right. Uh, two perpetually ravenous dogs, right? And a nonstop squawking parrot. Yeah. So writing seems attractive. Dude, all through 2020, everybody was praying for a vaccine. Yeah. I was praying for COVID. <laughs> <laughs> Go, come on, grandma, cough yeah. in my mouth, wrap it up. Right? right. Right. But here's the good news. The good news is at nine o'clock, that damn bird would go to bed. They would throw the cloak over the cage. He'd go to right. sleep. I would return treat upstairs. You can't do that for kids, by the way. I know. I know. Listen, on that. I've tried. They end up kicking, you know? <laughs> um, but no, I would go upstairs. I had my own little room. I would, and I would just write, man. And yeah. it was, I ended up, I wrote like eight feature films and three pilots. And I'm not saying they were all ready to rock, yeah. but I at least got them done. Yeah. You know, so. You didn't have the writer's block that you might've had if you were sitting there trying to write and didn't, uh, have a motivation to be away. Absolutely. You know, and I tell people, I tell other writers, man, I always think that like writing is not hard. Sitting down to write is hard. Yeah. Like making yeah. yourself actually do it. You yeah. Know? A lot of good excuses. 100%. That's outstanding. I can't wait to see some of these things pop. You've been very uh, generous to, to do the podcast and also. Oh, to thank you, man. Thanks for having me. And perform and uh, your class act. I can't wait to keep following your career and maybe perform together again sometime. Thank you very much. Oh, can I do just a quick plug about I my special? I, okay. <laughs> I, my name is Claude Stewart. It's a C L A U D E last name. Stewart S T U A R T. Hit me on uh, Instagram. It's it's uh, C L A U D E S T U A R T four Claude Stewart four. If you type my name in my website, you know, it'll, it'll pop up. You'll see me, but I'm all over social media. I'm doing a thing right now where I am selling my latest special and it's very politically incorrect, R rated crazy, but it's some of the most clever, most original stuff I've ever done. Please get it. It's called Claude Stewart. I've already started. If you buy that, then you can DM me directly. I would, I'm giving away two more of my specials uh, with it. So that's three for the the price of one one is r-rated one is pg-13 and then one is completely g family friendly so it's a lot boom. of good laughter for you and uh yeah somebody's seen him up front and also uh seen him online streaming he's a uh, funny he brings it every night lots of great energy Lots of great physicality. The guy can uh, <laughs> kick higher than a punter or a rocket. So you, right. you definitely want to check out Claude Stewart. He's a class act. And I appreciate you being on the My First Rodeo podcast. Absolutely. Thank you, Mike. Well, there you have it. That was me talking to Claude Stewart. I think it was interesting. Claude's a different kind of comedian. He's kind of got some old school to him. He's, uh, you have to see him in person. And uh, this might've been one of the instances where a video podcast would have been more fun, but I definitely encourage you to check him out on YouTube. Uh, check out his dry bar comedy special. He's got several uh, comedy specials out right now. He uh, does this crazy thing where he high kicks like a punter. Um, he's, acts like a rock star. He moves around. You know, the show that he and I did did not have a large audience, but he uh, played it as if it was a large audience and really gave everybody a great show. So I just applaud him for his professionalism, his humor, his fast pace idness, if that's a phrase. And uh, he's always creating. He's, uh, as he, as he said during our interview, he's uh, writing things. He's got a four person production company. So uh, he's made a real nice career out of just being versatile and flexible and taking every day seriously. Uh, gosh, when I was uh, getting ready for the show here, which again was not a huge show, um, he was, uh, I wouldn't say yodeling, but warming up his vocals in a very, uh, uh, you know, just a methodical way and, uh, you know, very conscientious about the venue and where things were and, uh, then did a really neat, organic, fun show. So just a great combination of, uh, organization, professionalism, and, uh, just good, funny stuff. So I encourage you to check out Claude Stewart. I encourage you to keep listening to the My First Rodeo podcast. Please share this one with other people. Go back and listen to some of the other podcast episodes if you haven't caught them all. Please subscribe and come back and join us on the My First Rodeo podcast. Bye, bye.